Hi, it's Jason Gorman here from Codemanship with Test Driven Development from Hell. Before we begin, just a quick shameless plug for some training that's coming up in the new year. Three weekend masterclasses, totally immersive, totally hands on. You'll be getting hours of really great practice. Um, I highly recommend them, of course I would, and um, they're great value for money. So if you're interested, um, please go and look at our training page. We've still got a few places left. Uh, details on there about dates and so on, and also a link to the booking page. Okay, that's the shameless plug out of the way. Um, test driven development from hell. So this is uh, an illustration of an assessment technique that I've been using with clients uh, and also been demonstrating at conferences over the last year. It's very effective at testing the extent to which programmers are in the habit of doing something. So in front of you, you'll see a worksheet, a test driven development worksheet, which lists 13 habits or practices or rules, if you like, um, that a peer group of programmers have come together and agreed that they will observe when they practice test-driven development for the purposes of this exercise. These worksheets are used in two ways. The first way is they're used as a sort of a pilot's logbook, if you like, or a pairing logbook. So whenever you pair with someone and you say, we're going to be following the rules for the next couple of hours, um, what you do is you nominate four of these practices and your pairing partner watches you like a hawk and every time they catch you failing to observe one of the practices, they make a mental note of that. At the end of the pairing session, they need to then sign you off on those a maximum of four practices um, that they are satisfied that you did indeed observe them for the duration of that pairing session. So it's used in that way to sort of um, focus your practice um, and also keep a, a record of um, the number of practice sessions, the number of pairing sessions you've done over the course of several months. At the end of that, when you feel you've completed the worksheet and you feel you've kind of got the hang of these things and not just got the hang of them, but you're in the habit of doing them, then we do an assessment. It's usually an all-day affair, but we're just going to do a very short illustration one now. Um, in the assessment, what happens is your pairing partner or someone from your peer group prints off a blank one of these worksheets and you do a programming kata. It could be um, the Roman numerals kata or the bowling game kata or whatever you've nominated from a list of set pieces, set examples that you as a peer group will use in your assessments. And you do the kata, you try to do it as much as possible by the book. And every time your pairing partner catches you failing to do something like for example, you do a refactoring and then you forget to run the tests. They put a big cross next to that in the box next to it. And they make a note of the time in minutes and seconds in the session that you did it. Normally when we do these with clients, um, people actually video themselves. They, they do um, screen captures of themselves doing these exercises. And then their partner watches them back and assesses them. So they can pause and so on and so forth and don't have to miss anything. Um, so I'm going to be doing one of these. I want you, when I say pause to pause this video, to download the blank worksheet, the link is in the explanation for this YouTube video, download a blank worksheet, um, print it off, so you've got a clean copy, get a pen or a pencil, and then we'll start. So pause your video now and go print off. Right, so you should have a blank worksheet and a pen or a pencil, and you're going to watch me do a test and development cata, and I'm going to try in as few minutes as possible, with as little code as possible, to break as many of these rules as I can. Okay. Right. I'm going to be working in Java. Let's create a new Java project for this. Let's just call it TDD from Hal. Now watch me very carefully, see what I do. Okay, and first of all, I'm going to declare a class test. So this is going to be our fib num gen class, our fib actually number generator. I'm going to put it in the codemanship namespace like so. And I'm going to declare a method that we're going to be testing. So we've got something to test. And this is a method that's going to give you the Fibonacci number at a particular position in the sequence. So, P for position, and I'll need to return a number just to get it to compile. Okay, good. 
Right. So at this point I can declare a J unit test class. This is our fib test class. Okay, and we're going to create a test method to test the method that we just declared. Okay, so we'll call this test fib. At. Okay, that's the name of the method that we're testing. I'm going to declare a new fib num gen. And I'm going to assert that the first number in the Fibonacci sequence should be zero. Like so. Okay. Um, now, before I run the tests, I better just fix. I don't think that's a particularly meaningful name. So let's rename that to. something more meaningful like that. Let's just continue with that. Right, okay, so if we save everything now, and if I run that test, I've got a feeling uh, that it will pass. And indeed it does, so we're safe to move on to the next test. which is the second Fibonacci number, should be 1. OK. Now, the simplest way I can think of passing this test might be something like Something like that. Okay. Now, I'm going to stop at this point, um, because I think I've already broken quite a few of the rules. Let me just um, save this and run the tests. Oh, actually, before I stop, I'm just one more thing I wanted to do. Um, I'm not too happy with the name of this. It's an integer, so it really should be called n. Okay, right, so we'll stop there. Now, how many rules did you catch me breaking? Well, let's count them. First of all, I didn't start by writing a failing test. I started by writing the model code under test. So that's a big no-no. What else did I do? Well, I started writing the test not with the assertion first, but with the setup. So that's another no-no. You may also notice that I've packaged the test and the model code together so they're not separated and also the naming of the test class doesn't follow the naming of the model class so our test code doesn't follow the structure and naming of the, the code that it's testing. What else did I do? Well um, I definitely didn't run the test to see it fail um, I, I had a feeling it would pass. I also did a refactoring before I'd seen the test pass um, so I didn't refactor on a green light. I technically refactored on a red light, even though I hadn't actually run the test to see the red light. Um, what else did I do? Well, I didn't keep my tests separate or isolated, and my tests don't test more than one thing. Uh, don't test one thing. So this FIBAT test one is actually two different test cases in the same test method. Um, you may also have noticed that when I did that refactoring, um, when I renamed the parameter P to N, I didn't run the tests afterwards, so that's another one. What else did you catch me doing? Well, this implementation here, to pass both of those assertions, it's arguably not the simplest thing I could have done. That would have been the simplest thing I would have done to pass the test, and it is fairly obvious. Um, so I didn't do the simplest thing to pass the tests. Um, so I would argue that I managed there to fail oh, a good nine or ten of the rules, I think, um, in just a few minutes. I hope you caught me um, failing on all of them that we've mentioned so far. There might be a couple more that I've missed that I've also failed on, and there will be a couple that I didn't manage to fit in. Um, but on the whole, a pretty good effort, I think, of test-driven development from hell.